I'll give you a little introduction about who I am and what I've been doing. Um, I've been at ATI for 30 years, DAR, um, for um, those four, uh, three functions. So, as DA, technical counselor, um, I've test pilot, flight instructor, CFWI, uh, examiner. Um, I did all the USUA and EAA ultralight instructor and examiner for many years. Over 8,000 hours and over 300 different aircraft. Over 30 aircraft, and um, my wife and I, Carol, are uh, authors of these two books that were written in 2004 and 2005. Uh, we're in the third printing of both of them. We are past winners of the U uh, the uh, USUA uh, Moody Award for Excellence in Aviation. Just a couple of the aircraft that I built. Uh, I built three of the Lancer 4Ps, including one with a turbine in the And we currently, our uh, lights are generally consumed right now with doing these lights work maintenance repairing classes. We are the only ones in the country right now that really have this class operational and are doing students. Uh, between the three-week class and the two-day class, we're now approaching nearly 3,000 students in all of the training that we've done uh, throughout aviation. Um, another aircraft that I've designed built from scratch called the Ranger. This was built to almost, uh, well, it must be 15 years ago now, so a long time ago. It still is in pliable condition and we use it on a regular basis in our maintenance classes because it's a nice open aircraft for doing that. My topic today is going to be the new project that I'm working on, which is the EMG-5. And the only reason that it's called the EMG-5, that stands for Electric Motor Glider Model 5. There's been 12 different derivations of aircraft that we have looked at trying to make an aircraft that we could actually meet all of the design criteria that we were interested in. And we've gone back and forth between these five derivations and we ended up with model number five of all the designs that we chose. And we haven't chosen a name yet. And so it's just now called the EMG-5. And remember, this is fairly early on in the whole process here. You'll kind of see the status of the airplane and how far along it is right now. But when we designed this aircraft, we had some specific design criteria in mind that we felt was essential in order to be able to make this aircraft um, viable. And so here's the 10 design criteria. It had to be part 103, it had to be a tricycle landing gear aircraft, electric power, safe aircraft with good performance, fully wings, low cost, simple construction, a good looking design, and it had to be a marketable product. So, the first item on the list right there is that the airplane had to be part 103 to be an ultralight. Um, our roots really come from the ultralight industry, and that's where we um, pretty much started um, aviation. I, I started flying ultralights back when the primary aircraft of choice was the old Quicksilver Model E weight shift aircraft. And so we've been doing this a long time and it's always been one of our uh, loads of aviation was in the light aircraft end of things. So here's the problem with part 103. There's three basic criteria that we have to meet in order to be able to meet a part 103. And when I say um, part 103, I talk about ultralights for those of you who don't know what part 103 means. The rules basically are, the three main criteria are that the aircraft has to weigh less than 254 pounds, has to fly uh, less than 55 knots, and it has to have a stall speed of less than 27.6 miles per hour. Now the dilemma here is really interesting because typically when we go to build an ultralight type aircraft, if we want to achieve that 27.6 mile an hour stall speed, a little bit of basic math is going to point to the necessity for a wing area around the neighborhood of 130 square foot of wing area. That's a lot of wing area. And some of them with a smaller wing, I mean with a thinner airfoil, upwards of 150 square foot of wing area. Well, that basically leads us into the category of something like a Quicksilver MX with um, you know, um, gap on sales, cloth sales, and that kind of configuration. Well, by the time we get an airplane into the category of 27.6 miles an hour in that 150 square foot of wing area, we really have a dilemma. We can't build that big a wing and keep it that light, and we can't keep it that fast because it's going to be a really draggy airplane because it's this kind of configuration. 
And since we wanted to have a really efficient airplane, in order to meet the other criteria, which was an electric aircraft, we knew that we had to keep the drag profile extremely low in order to be able to take advantage of the limited capacity that we have available in batteries today. And so what we did is we came up with an idea that said, let's just limit the wing area to 105 square foot of wing area. Now that will keep our small speed in the neighborhood of about 36 miles an hour, which really doesn't get anywhere close to um, the stall speed requirement for Part 3, but it will help us keep that construction lightweight enough that we don't have a lot of uh, material and we can actually meet that 254 requirement. So in order to help with the whole situation, what we've done is we've added power flaps into the inboard section of the wing. So we have six foot span of power flaps on either side. These are true power flaps with a very nice big shirting area to be able to control that airflow over the flaps or maximize the amount of lift in that area. The problem with power flaps on a lightweight aircraft like this is that that large of a flap area, and these are really big core flaps, creates a pretty significant pitching moment on the aircraft that wants to pitch the airplane over. The normal way that we deal with the pitching moment is that we have up elevator on the tail in order to pull the tail down to overcome that pitching moment. Well, that down, that up elevator and downward force on the tail is not a upward force, it's a downward force. So we're kind of ruining what we've gained out of those power flaps by creating an opposing force going downward. And that ruins a lot of the power flap effect that we have there. What we've done to compensate for that is on the front of the airplane where the two electric engines are mounted on the canard, is thrust vectoring motors that allows us to rotate those engines to create a positive pitching moment that will overcome that, that pitching force that's caused by the uh, flaps. And not only that, but allow us to move the center of gravity on the aircraft forward enough to where we can have a very far forward center of gravity and move that weight that we're carrying off of the, off of the wings onto the canard. So here's what we end up with. We end up with a twin-engine airplane that thrust vectors, each of those engines is capable of producing 100 pounds of static, actually 99.3 pounds of static thrust. We have a canard that's a lifting surface on the front. We have a lifting body fuselage blended into the wing for optimal performance, 105 square foot wing area, power flaps, and we can even overpower full down elevator with the use of a, um, with a throttle and uh, positioning of the motors on the front of the aircraft in order to overcome that. That allows all of these forces to be a lifting force, and the ABS software that we use is predicting stall speeds in the neighborhood of 22 miles an hour, putting the information into the X-Plane's configuration using the ABS software, we are consistently flying the aircraft in that configuration at 22 miles an hour under controlled conditions. So we have a group of guys that um, are really X-Plane um, uh, enthusiasts that have decided to take on the task of generating um, a model that is very close to, and they continue to evolve this airplane. I noticed on the X-Plane's website the other day that they now have a new version with a clear canopy and some refinements on it. They keep working to make it more and more realistic, but this is pretty close to um, anticipated um, flight performance that we typically see on the aircraft. It kind of gives you an idea of what the aircraft looks like. So that, that basic configuration of flaps don't look very realistic at this point. The uh, piece lines is kind of close to what it should look like. They're still having some problems with blending the thing, and I supply them with uh, 3D modeling stuff that they haven't been, been able to convert into um, um, a file to use next time yet, but that's coming. Kind of, no, they'll get to it eventually. Number two on the criteria list is that it's going to be a tricycle landing gear. And everyone agrees that if you're a low time pilot, a tricycle landing gear is a favorable condition on the airplane in order to be able to um, make it a little uh, easier to handle for landing, takeoff, and maneuvering. 
Um, number three on the criteria list was electric airplane, and of course this is an electric power airplane. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. The motors that we have chosen are the Plettenberg Predator 37 motors. These are nothing more than giant scale RC motors that are out in the industry currently being used. Um, they are proven technology. Um, all of the electric system on this aircraft is already existing technology. It's off the shelf stuff. Batteries, controllers, motors, and charging systems that exist in the model airplane industry today. Now that engine that you see right there is swinging a it's actually a 35-inch propeller that's on there with a 13-inch pitch, which is ideal for the speed range in Part 103 that we're trying to achieve. Now remember, we will make this airplane capable of flying in the amateur build category as well. However, um, the, the, the advantages there, of course, are that you know, we can really increase the amount of batteries, we can fly faster, we can fly in other airspace. But Part 103 is really our target that we're shooting for. Here's the actual motor. Um, the existing propellers out there um, that are being built and um, produced today, um, currently available, they're carbon fiber blades. Uh, the blade hooks and the blade mounts that are in there we've manufactured so that we can uh, experiment with the airplane using some different uh, pitch settings. Even though that's not optimal, they'll probably be real close to the original pitch settings on the thing anyway. But the cooling spinner, the three blades, the blade mounts, the hub, the motor itself, and those two uh, motor knocks that it mounts with, all of that together weighs 5.3 pounds. That is 16 horsepower for 5.3 pounds. If you know anything about horsepower to weight ratio, that's pretty phenomenal when you get right down to it. The best gas motors out there were pushing one to one for, uh, horsepower per pound out there. So this is three times that, really. And pretty phenomenal when you think about what the capability is in these little electric motors that are, that are there. And we have two of those. So we have a total of 32 horsepower, and we have a um, total of 99, uh, or 199 pounds of static thrust available to us. Now, if you're, if you're not familiar with really the relationship with uh, static thrust there, that's the equivalent. Well, let's, let's give an example. A Rotax 277 with a 66 inch propeller, uh, 28 pitch on a 2.58 gearbox is 180 pounds of static thrust. So we're doing a little better than what a Rotax 277 would be. And Rotax 277 was really one of the, the leading engines in the early days of um, the ultralight industry. It was a perfect um, uh, 28 horsepower motor that was used. Um, uh, for a lot of ultralights, and if you can find them, there's still a few of them floating around that way now. Safe aircraft, all of the aircraft is designed using a program called SolidWorks. It's a 3D modeling program. Uh, we have full um, finite element analysis capability. All of the components that are in the aircraft um, are uh, designed using this program. We will um, we'll look at some more pictures of that as we go. Now, you have seen these little flying platforms, um, little radio control, four engine, six inch little flying platforms. Some of them they fly with the iPad, some just little controllers. A couple hundred bucks and they fly around and cover around the room. They use um, a little microprocessor called an Arduino, and the technology on your cell phone or these little Nintendo controllers that have the gyros built into them to process the information to maintain stability control in the airplane. Well, we intend in not the original or the first couple derivations to be able to take advantage of that technology for thrust control so that we cannot exceed the critical angle attack. That's one of the uses that we will eventually use. But we also want to use, on the vertical axis, we want to be able to control the yaw rate of the aircraft and maintain perfectly coordinated flight while you're flying the airplane, and the future goals are to even control yaw control so much that it would be impossible for you to spin the aircraft. Our goal here, if we're going to build an ultralight type aircraft with low time pilots, one of the things that would really be nice to do is eliminate the possibility of the stall spin accident, which is our number one bugaboo that we have out there. We eventually even believe that in the Part 103 category that we can develop the battery technology 
and the controller technology to the extent that we'll eventually come up with a model that eliminates the rudder and all of the rudder control system in its entirety, running just a vertical stabilizer, flying the airplane with aileron and elevator only, using the microprocessor to maintain perfect coordinated flight and prevent small spin accidents in its entirety. This is all high in the sky. This is several derivations down the road, but that's where we're headed with this. Um, we have a ballistic parachute system um, that we've already purchased that is going into the aircraft. Let me turn this volume down here a little bit. Um, this is just one of the um, videos that the boys made up for um, an example of using the ballistic parachute system. The BRS, uh, I think it's uh, reducing the um, 750 or something like that is on the airplane. And it'll be a standard um, installation. We would get credit on part 13 for the installation of the parachute. It doesn't cut into the empty weight of the aircraft. So the penalty is simply in the fact that it will affect your total gross weight of the aircraft. And that's a significant penalty which I've often with whether or not it's worth it, but of course on a prototype, um, we're going to have a ballistic parachute on there. Um, I've, I've done prototype test flight stuff a lot, and it's always nice to think that that parachute is right there. So we just demonstrated a uh, departure stall, and we're actually flying it to get it off into uh, a super stall spin uh, scenario here. play with this, it's kind of fun to have the X-planes to kind of play with, but even with the parachute out there, because we have thrust vectoring on the thing, it's kind of fun to play with once the parachute is deployed, we can start changing the vector of the motor and going to full throttle, and we can actually reduce the sink rate down to about 300 feet a minute on the, on the sink rate on the thing playing with the motors. I don't know how realistic that would be, but we don't need to watch all the pedals. So, 
Our plan for this airplane is to be able to build this airplane significantly under 20K to 20K to well over 20K. Lots of different configurations. I remember when I was 19 years old and I was in the Navy and I wanted to build an airplane in the worst way. And there just wasn't facilities and I didn't have any money. But if I could, if I could just start with one part and start building, and I actually did that. I actually bought the plants for an Osprey II and started building little components and storing them in my locker. And you know, but it was you know, it was really fun. It was just that whole process of you know I'm going to be involved with building airplanes. And, you know, it's a really exciting process. I want to be able to provide that for others to be able to do that. So what we're doing is we are providing all of the plants, 100% of the plants, PDF drawings, JPEG drawings, uh, e drawings with 3D modeling where you can take the component, you can rotate it around, and you can look at it just using uh, Internet Explorer. All of that stuff, builder videos, um, all of that stuff we're going to provide for you 100% for free. We're not going to charge a nickel for you to go online and get access to any of that. We're going to give it to you 100% for free. And that's going to allow a lot of people, especially overseas, that don't have easy access to the manufacturer um, to access that kind of stuff. And our business model is based on this. Everybody says, well, why are you going to do that? How are you going to make any money giving away all this stuff for free? Well, we kind of are using what we call the Google model. We're going to give 95% away for free. But we're going to do some quick build stuff. We're going to provide some kits. We're going to pre-build a lot of stuff. And whatever you want to do, you can build. Whatever you want to buy, you can buy. We're not going to hamstring anybody. We want to make this as easy as possible for people to build this. All of the parts that are on the airplane are capable of being built by hand. Um, a lot of the parts, like the carbon fiber molded parts, would be much more difficult to build. You'll probably buy those from me. But we also want to be able to provide um, a low-cost method for building some of these parts, rather than have to build a mold for a component. Um, we'll set up a section in there on that particular component, say this is how you build the ball and carve it down and glass on the top of it. We really believe that the overall market is in reducing the cost, getting the number of people building up, and selling what parts we do sell, make lots of them so we get the cost per unit down to where it's reasonable. The main reason why so much of the stuff costs so much is because we don't build enough of them that it's not very cost effective to build. Uh, specific component. So cost is really a significant part of our whole um, um, plan that we have here in our business plan. Right now the plans will not be online 100% or even probably close to 10% initially because I don't want to let the plans go out until after we have both finished the test flights and finished the actual structural load testing and seeing whether or not this is a viable product. We have a great team, and we've got more people coming on board right now. Uh, we have several engineers that are electrical engineers working on the power plant and controller system. Uh, we just uh, have had a couple other people that have uh, come on board both as consultants and as business people. And we've got some engineers in the structures section um, that are helping us. Um, the basic uh, aerodynamics of this thing was done by the ADS software. If you're not familiar with that, over in Hangar D is um, EPA, if I say that correctly, with his software that he's using. It's kind of an internationally known software. He's from Denmark. Uh, but we're using his software to generate the numbers that were, were coming up aerodynamically on there. Simplified construction. All of the aluminum components that you see on the aircraft are max drilled. So there's no jigs required. It is basically clean the thing together, pop rivet or solid rivet construction on a lot of it. Most of it will be pop rivet construction. Most of the, um, all of the compound curves that you see on the airplane will be carbon fiber, non-structural stuff, it's just um, super, super lightweight. Some examples are the nose cone weighs 14 ounces. Um, one half of the rudder fin, the top of the rudder, the fairing up there, is four ounces. Um, we're, our weights, part 103 is extremely difficult. In fact, if you've ever been involved with an ultra-light type aircraft, you know how difficult it is really to get into that category. Um, it, it's just such a massive challenge. We've got some really unique techniques on saving weight. 
Uh, one of the things that we are doing is in the skins of the aircraft, um, we are putting lightning holes. Now, lightning holes properly placed increase the strength and reduce the weight simultaneously. The problem is when you start to put lightning holes on the top of the weight skin, it kind of sucks for aerodynamic performance when you do that. So, we actually are using a, a material very similar to UPS tape. In fact, we're using, just using UPS tape to skin over those skins to cover those holes. But that's on the base layer, and then we're not painting the airplane because the weight of paint is extreme. I mean, you know, 103 airplane paint is really expensive. So what we're doing is we are covering the entire airplane in a 3M vinyl wrap with graphics printed onto this stuff. So you see these cars where they do the, the printed vinyl wrap. Very, very lightweight 3M vinyl wrap. So you can do all of your graphics, make a beautiful airplane but it's just vinyl wrap. But the vinyl wrap's purpose is actually to cover all the anomalies so we get a really smooth skin, reducing the friction, increasing the performance, and reducing the drag on the aircraft. That's just one of the main techniques that we're doing. All of the plans will be on the website. Here's an example of what we're doing. Um, if you've been in the large aircraft industry, um, they use a system called the APA code or the JASCO code, which is the joint aircraft, the Joint Aircraft Systems Component. But it's a universal code around the world that they use if you're working on one airliner and if you're working on landing gear system, well, landing gear system is always the same chapter in the book. And when you get these large aircraft, really it's hard to keep track of where the components are. But this code was developed so that when you move from one aircraft to another aircraft, you're using all of this. And that code's been well developed over multiple years. So why reinvent the system? We're just using their invented system. And so everything, when you go into um, our system in here, if you go into Chapter 53, um, all of these watch stuff is in Chapter 53, and then it breaks down into the next segments. So in this case right here, Chapter 53, the part number up there, 53, 50, 10. 53 is fuselage, watch, 50 is aerodynamic fairings, and 10 is the nose cone. And then there's all of these drawings that will be there, um, videos on all the other tips, how many of you here have seen the home builder tips that EAA puts on the, the uh, builder's tips? If you haven't been to see those, they're, they're great little builder's tips. But we're doing a lot of that, very similar, but specific to each particular component that we're building. A lot of work involved in that, and um, but I believe in the long run that's going to really help with that whole process. Number nine was the aesthetic design. We wanted a cool looking airplane. And, any glider pilot will tell you if it looks cool, it's going to fly cool, you know, there's something about a really sleek looking design that you can correlate to how the performance is going to be. And we believe that we really um, hit a home run there. It's a good looking airplane. Uh, marketable product. Um, one of the ways that we think that we can open up the market around the world there's a lot of people in a lot of countries that really are passionate about aviation. But it's so hard to get excited about building a project where you have to, every time that you want to build something, buy something, it's got to come from a long ways away. One of the reasons we want to put all of this online for free is so that someone that's off out the building someplace will have access to this and they can do one of two things. They can either work off of those plans and build that, or they, before they can start to build their plane, they can say, you know, this looks way beyond my capability, or I think I can do this. And so uh, we believe that we can increase our market. I noticed, um, just to show you, the website's been up for four months now. Um, yesterday, there was 22,600 hits yesterday, just for a single day. And that's what the website will be up for four months. So, month we get these bizarre numbers. This month, Argentina, for some reason. Anybody here from Argentina? Something's happened in Argentina. Argentina's got like half the number of hits of all of the United States combined. I don't know what's going on over there, but uh, something's happening. Um, here's a, this was about a month ago, showing the fuselage on the landing gear. The nose rack, uh, retract landing gear system is functioning. The motors we've been uh, operating, we're now building all of the the carbon fiber fairings and the canard and the rear fuselage carbon fiber bolt for the um, for 
the articulating pods that are out there. All the tail section is done. We're working on the bolts for the tail. Um, uh, all of the all of the tooling for the composite parts. It's all hard tooling going in. So we're really gambling on this because you know there's a lot of cost in making all of those individual tools to build those composite parts like that. But we're we're believers. We we believe we're going to be able to do that. Uh, one of our customers uh, brought over a train for a DAR inspection the other day and um, in the back of his RV he had his gold wing. So I told him to pull it up alongside the airplane just for a little perspective on really the size of this airplane. It's a, it's a very low drag profile aircraft, um, not, very, uh, not very big at all. And once again, weight, 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 weight. We're just really, really cons concerned about weight. Literally every single component that we manufacture, we weigh, we validate the weight. The, the SolidWorks software will generate a weight on all of this, so we've got a pretty good idea coming out. But there is a pile of parts six feet high over in the corner because I got a part, finished it up, looked at it, realized oh, I can make that three ounces less. So generate a new part, put it on the airplane. We keep evolving this airplane, trying to get it lighter and lighter. Um, kind of a cool looking profile from the front, um, front view of the airplane. Um, one of the very controversial, um, all windows have been in the thing so far. There are uh, construction photos that go along. The construction photos actually will probably be generated towards the actual individual chapters. So if you want construction photos about the nose cone, you'll go to that section. That's where they'll be. There's going to be so many um, that that's probably the only way we'll be able to manage it. But there's some photos that are on there right now that you can go see that thing. Um, the renderings that we created just using the SolidWorks software. Um, I'll bet you couldn't tell I was a Navy guy. Uh, fake that out. A bunch of media files that are on there and renderings of the aircraft also. One of the things that's very controversial is that um, the pilot is laying down crumb flying on his belly. And a lot of comments about we don't like that. And I understand the concern, believe me. It was one of the hardest decisions we had to make. But over all of those 12 different designs that we looked at in whole, we found that the ability to meet all of the other design criteria really kept leading us back to the fact that we had to be laying in the front position with the center of gravity of you know, the pilot directly over the center of gravity of the aircraft. Not having the pilot way out in front of the center of gravity where we had to have all the structure to support him. Safety concerns, having the pilot as the first point of impact in the crash is usually not favorable to the pilot. We actually have designed, yeah, just like in a car, we have crumple zones built into the airplane for both forward impact and straight down impact so that we can absorb the energy. We're very concerned with safety, rollover protection, so that if the airplane does slip over, you're not going to come out of this smash. There's lots of airplanes out there right now that I do check rides in and I do flight instruction in that we already know going in that if we flip the airplane over, we're going to die. And that's the choice that we make when we hop in those airplanes. I don't like that compromise, really. I'd like to have an airplane where um, safety is really of utmost importance to us. But the prone position, we've tried every other configuration that we can think of in order to get the pilot seated upright, and we think that it'll have to be a two-place aircraft, really, to be able to do that, and it'll be more, um, more feasible at that point. Um, the, the proof is, well, here's the bottom line. If I can't make that a comfortable position, this will be a total failure. So you've got to think that I'm a believer that I'm going to be able to pull this thing off. I can, I can try and tell you that that's going to be comfortable all day long, but the proof is in the pudding. And, you know, first couple that we build, if someone just doesn't like that, or they sit in the demonstrator and they don't like that, then it's not going to sell airplanes. So we, we recognize that we're going to have to make that, um, make that work. Um, interestingly enough, you can take an angler pilot and ask him what he thinks about it, and he says, what are you talking about? That's not normal position. They all fly in that position, and they're all totally comfortable, and they enjoy that position. And I'm actually, um, when I was in junior high, I built my first hang glider, so I've, I've been doing the hang glider along the years. And um, 
I actually enjoy that position. It seems like when you're in an aircraft, you're actually the bird. You're, you're really in a flight position rather than a kickback high long for a ride. So, Complex, retractable gear, multi-engine, and no certificate. 
the airplane well below $20,000 by putting in small motors, then as time evolves, up the amount of batteries, up the size of the motors, whatever the case may be. One of the, one of the things that we really like about it is we could fly primarily as a glider. It's got a design glide speed of 125 miles an hour, so we could tow it behind a pond or just a conventional airplane, or we could tow it behind a Warner's Dragonfly.
uh, gene loading uh, positive instead of like 4.4 for um, ASPM compliance or even what is it, 3.8 for standard category. Um, but I'm using that as the, the standards. And actually, on one of the resource pages on the website, you can go download all of that lighter criteria handbook for free um, from some other college, but it's a PDF for me to download, take a look at how they're doing it. We're designing to a 650 pound gross weight, even though we, we really think that part one three, in order to really meet all of this criteria, we're going to need to be right around 550. That's where we're going. But we're designing the airplane for 650 to put it in the amateur bill category. And you know how you know, all of you guys that buy airplanes, the first thing you do get home is you put them to the aircraft's first catalog. You go, oh, cool, look at this. Let's buy one of those. Let's buy one of these. And we're going to your 550 pound airplanes. But they won't get to 650. You know? So we're, we're going to design it so that we'll have a few more options in the amateur bill category. So that's the design that we're doing. There's going to be a lot of compromises in 103, no brakes. Um, there's no nose wheel steering on either of the models, amateur or 103. But we don't need we don't need nose wheel steering because we can take those motors, a little bit of power. The CG is real close to the center of gravity anyway. There's a tailwheel in place. A little bit of thrust, boom, the nose comes off the ground, differential braking, and we'll just tax it around with the nose off the ground. So even though most gliders don't have nose wheel steering, also we've got that option that if we want, we can even put that motor back and we can back the thing up, be like a C-130 back into our parking spot, um, you know, some options like that. But by not putting those wheels steering, by keeping the airplane really low to the ground, the length of the landing gear is really short, the nose gear, you know, all the mechanisms for the nose gear are very light, light, weight the nose gear. But because it's not steering, we don't have the complexity, the weight gets really down there. Use those Suze light, um, um, not on reinforced um, uh, wheel, like, 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 you know, that's everything. So, even on the 103, probably no brakes, probably no brakes at all. But we can go reverse thrust, and eventually we'll be able to just go reverse thrust with motors point straight out with the paint. Why a retractable ending here? Drag. With electric airplane, um, in order to in order to get that efficiency, you know, all that drag we have on the airplane. Um, that, we got to overpower that somehow. So the more we reduce that, those landing gear legs that you saw on there, those the main landing gear, they're 7075 T6 machine gear. They weigh 3.5 pounds per gear, pretty lightweight. It's a compromise. We intend on making a simpler Pro Molly version. Probably cost uh, probably weigh a little bit more, but um, get the cost of building the thing down. Those are kind of expensive gear with the right now. But we believe that it was one of the criteria that would make the electric viable. And as time goes on, um, you know, 100 pounds matters is quite a bit. But you know, when you start, when you start packing on a drag, that really makes a big difference. And, and we literally, um, the, the ABS software says that full throttle, the drag profile of this airplane will do um, 120 miles an hour. So that's a full throttle. Of course. That would be probably few minutes of 130 miles an hour, you know, it's not very practical. But it's all based on drag. Remember, drag increases the square of velocity, so going just a little bit faster costs you an awful lot in power. More questions? Yeah. Will the batteries go into the wing? No, in a fuselage. Actually, one of the cool things that we did, in order to justify to the FAA, that the batteries are not part of the um, empty weight of the aircraft is we have a patent that we are pursuing for gestionable battery packs. Now everybody says, well, you can't you just launch some big old 100 pound batteries out of people's backyards. But we're not really thinking about that. What we are thinking, though, is as technology evolves, um, we will be able to have a little battery pack bolted to the bottom of the airplane. And we've even, we've even looked at this, put it on our Schweitzer 233 for testing. But it's basically a model airplane. And you cruise around and uh, once you've used up the battery, you just come back and you jettison the thing. It's a glider. Either a guy sits on the ground with his RC, does this thing landing, or eventually, autonomously, it just flies back to the airport and lands itself kind of thing. 
Now that's pie in the sky at this point in time. But because it's possible and we have current technology to actually do that, pack around, you know, one of the advances in batteries is this lithium air battery, but most people don't realize that the catalyst that we're using for the for the um, energy production is air. And so the lithium air batteries are actually accumulating weight as we use them, because we're using the air out of the air to actually. So if you're using this thing up as it gets heavier and heavier and heavier, cut that baby loose and let's go fly around without it as a light. And I'm totally aware of how bizarre this all sounds, believe me. But it does help put our point across that batteries are not part of the empty weight. I hope that it has some impact on it. But initially, depending on the batteries we choose, um, you know, there's still some significant issues with wires and battery safety and that kind of stuff that's out there. The offloading of the weight by putting the batteries out in the plants right now it doesn't seem like it's worth it because of the weight associated with the cables coming back to drive loads out there. So right now we've got the cans of panels that pop down on the belly of the aircraft, keep the center of gravity low and in a place where we can eliminate the fire. Is the new presenter here yet? How's my time doing? Okay. And one more bit about the soil state and affected by the out of power. Okay, so let's talk about the soil state. You're all thinking this vector thrust and this is way too complex. Part 103 doesn't say that we have to fly the airplane at 27.6 miles per hour. It says that the aircraft must be capable of 27.6 miles per hour. So we have no intention on the initial prototype, on the initial production aircraft, that anyone ever flies with moving the thrust ever at all except for ground operations. In flight, we'll leave it pushing position forward. And but the airplane does have the ability to do that. But you're not going to do that. You're going to fly it like a conventional airplane. We're using that technology to be able to meet the requirements of the rule, but now we're going to go back to having a 35 mile an hour stall speed on the aircraft. So believe me, we've done explains enough. There's some weird stuff that can happen when you start putting those motors 90 degrees to the airstream, um, and especially going to full throttle at that position. You can do some really cool loops with it, though. Wah, 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 it'll just drive the thing on the show. That evolution of using the vector thrust in a vertical configuration initially, that's a long ways off, and we're going to really have to get to the point where we've got a microprocessor controlling that pitch attitude reliably before we can ever do that effectively. And we don't intend that. We're doing that so that we can meet part 103. And none of this is none of this is cheap. Um, everyone I've talked to in the FAA says this is we love people that really stay within the rules. But we're very interested in that. We're not interested in um, you know building one thing and then having everybody else go do something different. We want to stay within the rules. We we really want to do that. But it's kind of like the FAA when they built Light Sport never intended that we had 180 horsepower Super Cubs flying around either, but they're within the rules, and everybody loves the fact that they really thought outside the box to be able to make that thing happen. So um, that's kind of how we're approaching this whole thing in the way. Just assume that when you build this as a beginner pilot, that motor's going to be flat out there all the time, you're not going to be playing. Believe that. That's why it's got a ballistic parachute. I'm going to do all that testing to figure out how that will be interacting. Yes. Just one more. It seems you could potentially defend. It's really a single-engine airplane by the way you configure the, you know, the power control um, and, and and so on. Do you have separate uh, left-right uh, problems? Yeah. Actually, system? I have a um, three guys from Chico State University that are kind of my um, electric whiz guys. And they're looking at some different possibilities for that, but I do want to be able to um, do some flight testing with differential control and operate single engine. Yeah. Um, the ADS software says we can very easily maintain altitude um, in a normal configuration single engine. Work in a normal cruise long, where I said an hour and 45 minutes on um, 100 pounds of batteries, that's like 25% full power. It's way, way down on power output. So there's a lot of reserve even there. And I don't remember what the numbers were, but there's a, what we would call critical altitude associate. No. This is so early, we shouldn't even be talking about that kind of stuff. This is a concept at this point. 
it will evolve. Kind of like you can see that happening with all the other electric airplanes that are going on out here. You know, every year, those guys that have been doing this keep getting bigger. Mark showed me his new 30 kilowatt motor that he's got for the Thunder Gold. That's cool. Basically, 40 horsepower. It's awesome. He's going to really have himself a hot rod there when he gets that thing done, especially on that Thunder Gold, which is a pretty fast airplane to start with. But, um, yeah, it's uh, evolving constantly. You know, batteries are evolving. One of the reasons we designed the airplane with the motors on the pods is because we know that by the time the prototype is flying, all the technology that we've chosen will now be out of date, and we'll have to just unbolt those pods and stick the next pods on there to put the next new technology. Not necessarily from the technology being better, because these motors are already about 93% efficient, but from the technology that instead of a $1,500 motor, it's going to be an $800 motor or a $600 motor or a $300 motor. It'll just continue to improve as time goes on. And we realized that the Part 103 Ultralight Experimental World doesn't have the numbers to be able to do technological development on the scale that it needs to be done. But the model airplane industry certainly does. Millions of these motors being developed and refined and sold. And, you know, they're, they're doing all the really hard work for us. We're just adopting what they've done already. And I don't think it's prudent for an aircraft designer to really take over the business of being an engine developer. I mean, they're kind of two different specialties, and so I'm concentrating on utilizing what other really brilliant, much more brilliant than I guys have 